And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have one of my good brothers here at the temple. The ma the man who it, who is Mr. No A's. <laughs> And, no way. And Twitter. the upcoming, the man who for the longest time has been developing for um, third party material for D&D 5th edition, but is now venturing into Pathfinder 2nd edition with Trails Through the Skies. The one and only James Streisand. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing fine. It's nice to speak with you again. Mm -hmm. um, so, what. Although I do, although I do have to wonder if you, if you, if you're um, breaking gimmick because I do see an A in that title. <laughs> there is a no, no, no. The the A's problem is starting with an A. If the name doesn't start with an A, it's okay. It's fine. We didn't get, we didn't delve into it, but what it, what is the story behind your hatred of names that start with A? Oh, it's just the first thing that people go to when they think of fantasy names, which frustrates me immensely. Uh, Warhammer does this literally all the time, and it's extremely annoying. It's like, because people come up with fantasy names by smashing syllables together, and they go down the they go down the list of possible syllables alphabetically, which means if they think of something, they have a higher chance of thinking of something with A that kind of works for them. And it's very, it's very lazy to me. And good writers, good writers don't do it at this point. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced. Um, but and also, I ban it from my game tables as I tell people you you are not allowed to have a character whose name starts with A. Now, when it when it comes to when it comes to that i'm i'm guessing it has to do with a being such a dominant vo dominant vowel in la in language that's my that's yeah my i mean guess, uh, it's least. it's the first letter in the alphabet is the problem so somebody thinks i'm going to come up with a name what am i going to go with their internal registry flips to the they they go through everything alphabetically and so the majority of people are going to settle as, well, or maybe not the majority of people but an inordinate number of people are going to settle on A because that's the first thing that they that they thought of, and that that's what frustrates me about it. Now, for like I said earlier, for the longest time you've been um, you've been working with the the um, the D, with working with D and D fifth edition, and now you're venturing into um, Pathfinder. Um, mm -hmm. What what prompted the shift over to Pathfinder Second Edition for this? Uh, well, it wasn't money. I can tell you that much because usually my answer for anything that I do in regards to tabletop gaming is money. At which point people look at me with uh, open eyes and say, well, "Why? Why are you here then?" Um, but no, with regards to Pathfinder Second Edition, there were a few. There were a few different incentives to carry on this particular venture. One was I have a co-writer, which I love. Uh, I absolutely, I, I, I adore having a co-writer. I adore my co-writer in particular makes things so much easier. And the system that one of the systems that they're most familiar with is Pathfinder second edition. Uh -huh. So I figured, Hey, uh, this is an opportunity for me to, pass the reins a little bit more in regards to does that my first opportunity to have a co-writer i can pass the reins over to whoever my co-writer is in regards to mechanics provided that in regards to the particulars you know what gets a plus one what gets a minus one bonus or penalty or whatever hap whatever it happens to be mm -hmm. and i can spend a lot of time doing what i think i love most which is writing lore at this point I've I've really gotten a taste for it. And in some of my earlier projects, I have not been able to indulge myself nearly as much as I... Like, there was an entire... I finally shipped Astral Tides this past month 
thank God we, we survived the pandemic and I finally managed to get it out uh, despite encountering a little bit of financial ruin in the process uh, of the pandemic, not necessarily sending out the fulfilling the books and stuff like that, though that contributed to it. And I have entire swaths of like descriptions of cities and stuff like that, that I was not able to include in the book because I did not have important locale. I didn't have the, the right number of important locales for all the planets that you could visit or all the important, the main major planets that you could visit in astral time. So it didn't, there wasn't room to include them. And when I have somebody, you know, I had to do things like I had to continue making sure that ships were balanced or, or conveyances, the not spell jammers. And, and so once everything happened there, it was like, I, okay, I need, I need a co-writer. I need somebody to, I need backup. And that backup was familiar with Pathfinder second edition. And that's why I originally chose it. There were things that made me fell in love with Pathfinder second edition afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when it comes, when, when it comes to, um, when it comes to a lot of this, I will, I will admit, I, I, I looked at the description of this. I'm, I'm thinking, how oh, is this, is this, is this James's attempt to bring Lords of Brackets into Pathfinder Second? <laughs> oh that... no, 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 no! Lords of Brackets is my, my, mine, mine, <laughs> my, my RPG. None will touch it. But I did. But I am bringing some setting material in. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, I'm not expecting you to make to to remake the whole thing in Pathfinder in Pathfinder Second or anything like that. I'm not that. I'm not that crazy. I'm crazy, but I'm not that crazy. <laughs> but part of it is part of it is just you delving all you delving once again into the notion of um airships which if i recall when i had you on a while back you had mentioned that part part of the part of the focus on that is was um because of the fact that the people who should know better kept neglecting this kind of thing yes yes the people who should know better uh, those those people in fantasy Seattle, because Seattle is not a real place, but fantasy Seattle, on the other mm -hmm. hand, is is quite real. Yeah. Uh, no place that is that is mundane would rain all the time, and therefore, the only Seattle that exists is magical. Now, the so when it comes to airships, it's like I I think I mentioned this. Actually, I can't remember when I mentioned this, but I think, and I have an essay cooking on it. I think that, yes, space is kind of like the final frontier, but I think there's one more that we've left on. I think we skipped a step when we started tackling space. Mm -hmm. I think that the I think the the idea of floating sit floating cities in the sky and, and traveling via air uh, and not being locked to the earth in the fashion that we are uh, being able to explore the sky, even though there's just I mean, there's just up air up there. Uh, it's just a matter of like colonizing it. There, there's a fantasy innate that just kind of draws me in because it's like, hey, not many people are, not many people are engaging with this because because it's the skip, it's the frontier that we skipped. It's the place that we never really put much of a focus on be, besides air travel, and, and which is huge. Like air travel is fantastic and amazing and stuff like that. But we don't live in the air. We don't live in the sky. Now we don't live in floating anything. We're we're always constantly just bound to the earth. And so there's a childlike wonder that I have when I look up to the sky and and that translates to that that translates to the tabletop products that I make. And then from there it's just figuring out which ones work and which ones don't. And I'm 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 sad to report that I'm not entirely sure if uh Trails of the Skies is going to make it past Kickstarter, though I will say we we are publishing it this at some point, whether it gets crowdfunded or not, just because of the sheer amount of work we've done on it. But I am happy to report that Pathfinder 2 is probably made this uh, the easiest I could imagine with, with regards to adding airships and having a wide array of customization options for them. 
it's always it's always been funny whenever whenever um whenever I see you dipping into dipping into um other other games aside aside from what you were more familiar with, um. Us usually in a case, usually in a case, usually with some sort of remark from from you of, geez, geez, all this all this stuff you could be doing. What? Why? Why isn't this being done? Why isn't this being done here? Kind kind of thing and. When you when you stepped into Pathfinder Second, what were what were some of the things that it did that really stood out for you? Nope, gonna call for a moment here. Oh. Alrighty, so the first thing that I have to comment on is the fact that there in the Game Master's Guide, which my co-writer helpfully owns, and and it's also publicly available on easily searchable websites that I don't have to buy a subscription for. Fantastic. Vehicles are very well, they're very well statted out. There are a number of traits and actions that relate to vehicles insofar as steering and, you know, certain, certain options are regarded as reckless. They have the reckless trait where if you fail, look, if, if this screws up, the vehicle is going to go out of control. And here is a, a degree of range in which it would, in which it would do that. There are all these things that are studded out previously. Prior to me doing any kind of work on my own, there, are, there is work done that has been done on the vehicles. That's a short explanation. The, the slightly longer explanation, my favorite thing, rather, is the fact that vehicles are listed or grouped by type, like what they're powered by, whether they are pulled or towed you could say mm -hmm. whether they are rowed whether they're powered by wind alchemy or you know powered by a no chemical engine or if they're magical and because these traits were done in advance i was able to say things like for instance like like, like in airships of Brachus, we had the patterns and these were a customization option that you could stack on top of one another. You could have a elf pattern and a dwarven dwarven pattern, or you could have you could have a hill dwarf pattern and a and a wood elf pattern, and that would change the function of your ship. And that was the customization option that you could stack. And then there were templates, which were customization options that you could not stack. Things like ornithopters or zeppelins, mm -hmm. right? And then some more fantastical ones. When it came to patterns here, ancestral patterns, which we didn't just do at ancestral patterns, we also had generic patterns, which which we have not revealed to the Kickstarter backers as of yet, actually, and we also had faction patterns, like you know, like a witch's coven or the winter court, things of that sort. But when it came to the ancestral patterns, we were able to say, okay, here is a separate pattern for an alchemical app airship, a magical airship, a pulled airship, a road airship, and a wind-based airship. And we were able to just add a, because they had already done this work in advance, I was able to say things like, okay, when it comes to, what's a good example? When it comes to, when it comes to dwarves, let's say, Mm -hmm. Like there's an alchemical, all right, an alchemical airship is going to have a heat ventilation system where if the airship gets strained or if it starts taking stress damage, uh, you are able to vent some of the excess fluids and, and fire around you. But also, and that's completely different from what it would be if you were running a dwarven pulled airship. And, you know, there's pulled air. Now that we have pulled airships, I can say things like, okay, what's an airship look like if it doesn't really have much forward control of its own? It's just something that you lash to a rock or a wyvern or a dragon. And what happens then? And so there, you just completely opened up the space of possibilities that I always wanted to do when I first did Airships of Brachus, but couldn't because there was literally no support for designers. In the, Like, you can't do anything you want in 5e. You just can't. And in Pathfinder 2, I don't know if you can do every, anything you want in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. I just know that I can do a lot more than I was able to beforehand. 
I'd, I'd imagine you, I'd imagine you um I, I'd imagine when you look when you looked at class when you looked at class design for Pathfinder 2e you were like finally I have choices I can make <laughs> oh my god yeah it, it was so strange to say like hey wait a minute wait a minute I can <laughs> I you, you mean I get stuff every level? You mean I get more than one thing every level? This is this is incredible. I have never, <laughs> I've I've never engaged with this before. I've never experienced this. Yeah. I feel so spoiled. <laughs> um, I've seen I've seen some I've seen some people say say that there that there is confusion about the different types of feats. I um, I don't see I don't see I don't see that honestly. Um when it comes now when it comes to when it comes to it with the with the whole con with the whole concept of um air of airships the the big question that I have with this is how crunchy is it go is it going to be cuz oftentimes you um whenever with vehicle con with vehicle mechanics in games you either have them being extremely fluffy, um, almost like it, almost like getting, almost like getting some expensive pancakes, or you have a case of ex of extremely crunchy, almost like getting some expensive pancakes. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, the worst offenders are ones where the vehicle may as well be a character sheet unto itself. Um, how har How far into the crunch are you going? So I, I, uh, I take a, I, I take, I mean, I just take a completely different approach to crunch where I start separating things into different modes of play or different types of engagements such that there is a, the, the maximum crunch is allowed, but it is split up into different parts that not all players are engaging with at any given time. So let's take, let's take mask. Let's take airship versus airship combat. Uh, airships are going to have a view range of which they're going to be able to reliably spot each other past clouds and things of that sort, and past which they're going to be able to make effective preparations for combat. And so you have an airship, you have a crew, you have a some mass combat mechanics. We're not making an entirely new war game, just something that's that's simple to resolve enough with regards to instead of rolling every piece of artillery individually how do we how do we resolve this and maybe giving players additional upgrade options for it and so you have that element of the game which is going to get probably passed off to the player who most likes engaging with the mass combat system but but something and this is a separate system that we've added in we've added dogfights to the game because i felt the need to uh to make this even more weird fantasy and and lean into vance and lean into uh some other some other appendix appendix and authors we added dog fights to the game and we added small fighter fighters is the working title we're going to replace that some variety but basically fantasy biplanes and uh quad planes and stuff like that i hope to god you weren't playing danger zone in the background while you were writing it oh no 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 never Never, not until not not until I get to the, not until I get to, not until I start finishing it up, anyways. But and, something I was thinking about because I had actually been here's back to our Gundam discussion. I was I was watching Iron Blooded Orphans again, uh -huh. and I think in the second season they did a really good job of showing the value of an ace pilot, where all the mobiles, you know, these ships come together and these ships are designed to fight one another. And so far as their weaponry is concerned. Which is why mobile suits are so valuable, because mobile suits can dodge enemy fire from these vessels, and then they can basically just hug the edge of the ship and start tearing it apart. So you need mobile suits of your own to counter that. Mm -hmm. And what the, the problem here is that your mobile suits and their mobile suits are mutually in the way of each other's line of fire, right? 
there's you you can't reliably shoot past them like you're really risking hitting your own guys mm -hmm. so you're fired the amount the degree to which you're shooting at the enemy from ship to ship is going to be somewhat minimal for a little bit for a little while and you're not going to be you're not going to be going all out at least at first until you start clearing out you know some of the enemy fighters and then you're able to start unloading the dogfighting system is where another section of, you know, this big, massive blo general blob of crunch is going to live because some of your players are going to be pilots. Some of your players are going to be in these dogfights and they're going to be basically effectively ace pilots who are going to be very difficult to defeat and they're going to have a lot more options than enemy pilots are. So there's another section of crunch that just lives in a system that whoever is running the mass combat is by and large not engaging with, except to say, okay, there are people in this in this cone of fire, and therefore you have to you have to scale back how much you shoot, otherwise you risk hitting your buddy. And then finally, on top of that, we have a you know there are different types of fighters. Uh, this is we're working in fantasy, so we can do things like we have air breaking. Uh, we could have things like melee based fighters was something that we came into. Uh, several months into development where we said, we we're like, oh, well, we're not going to have an allegory for the, for the paladin, for the champion is uh, Pathfinder's version of it. And then I said, I hit up Knight and I was like, hey, does, uh, are there like melee abilities like Smite in, um, in Pathfinder 2nd Edition? And we kind of went back and forth and the, the, the eventual answer was, yeah, there's a few different melee abilities that take effect once you once you start using a melee weapon I was like, okay, okay, well, what if we, what if like the wings of a fighter were just like one really big melee web and we just went, we just went from there <laughs> so that we could have an allegory for the champion in the, uh, in the fighter. So that, so that's another section of crunch is we have mass combat and there's crunch there. And so far as upgrading units and upgrading the different pieces of artillery and the ship stat blocks themselves are not really complex at all. Mm-hmm. But you you can customize those ship stat blocks, and you can and there's a section of crunches, the ship customization, and once you do that ship creation, it's not you're not going to engage with that that section of the game much afterwards until you start making a new ship, or if you spend a lot of money to kind of like respec it, it's just going to be something that does not change on a sheet in front of you, and that sheet is going to be relatively easy to leave or read. Then you move on to things like mass combat. We're looking at pieces of artillery that you have. And that's probably a separate player that's interested in that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Managing the attack rolls with different units. Now, and then after that, you have ship defenses mm -hmm. and the intricacies of ship-to-ship -ship combat, which lives in dogfighting. And that's a separate player. And this allows a given group, a, diff a given gaming group to engage with the crunch on their own terms there is a wide mass of crunch out there but it lives in separate systems yeah. is the tldr now when it comes to dog fighting and when i consider how do how dog fighting tends to work this ends up raising a question for me and this is mm -hmm. a question that i've had many many times with d20 based games and that is how do you reconcile um the notion of grid, the notion of grid-based combat with vehicles. Okay. The fir first, all right. First things first is we actually just have a separate grid. We just have a wider grid. Like, okay, this is a fifty. Each square is a fifty-foot space, mm -hmm. and we don't really care because the global movement speed for Pathfinder Second Edition characters is twenty-five feet. And given that most ships are going to be somewhere in the most ships are in the fifty to two fifty range, uh, they're only going to be occupying a few square, and the vast majority of them are going to be fifty to one hundred. So the vast majority are going to be occupying uh, one to two squares. We're not terribly concerned with player movement and putting you know put putting their exact position. On a in a mass battle, placing the character's exact position on the board. 
they're on this ship and this ship is over here. And that's, that's sort of the range of engagement. Once people start boarding your ship and stuff like that, then you can, then you could, you know, map out the ship or whatever and start putting characters down. That's, that's fine. But up until that point, you're working in a different scale of the grid. Uh, And then the fighter, I I guess to clean up the the grid question with regards to how we're approaching the grid in that aspect is the fighters have been tuned, their speeds have been tuned to ensure that they are generally speaking moving from one space to another. Like their, their speeds are all higher than 50 and actually a few of them are higher than 100. So they're moving from square to square to square to square. As opposed to trying to calculate, like, you know, <laughs> this one is, oh, well, this one is 75. What do I do? No, we have we have, we have have something for the GM to help resolve those instances in which, you know, something might be fractioned off. But our other solution to that is the dogfighting mechanics themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, is, this was most important for people who might be out on patrol and maybe somebody doesn't really feel like drawing up a grid because it's a one-on-one dogfight, which I think actually works slightly better in terms of narrative. Uh, But you also have the option of just doing a grid if you really want to. Is that we measure things like height and different terms of engagement within a maneuver system. So you're able to do dogfighting maneuvers like the barrel roll, Not the aileron roll, the barrel roll, scissors, Mm -hmm. breaking, doing a low yo-yo, a high yo-yo. And instead of tracking exact height, we use these maneuvers as kind of a proxy for them because these maneuvers provoke or produce different conditions for you and whoever it is that you're fighting with. So we created created four conditions which largely do nothing except modify the effects of certain maneuvers they are pursuing pursued engaged or disengaged and these mainly help track things like okay is somebody on your six is somebody on your six or are you guys just doing passes at one another Uh, if somebody's on your six you are pursued and they are pursuing Mm mm-hmm uh, if you guys are just making passes at one another, or if you guys are just, let's say, how do you like say you guys are, you know, in a scissors maneuver where you're kind of uh, side by side and you're trying to get get the edge on one another and you're timing your breaks and timing your rolls to kind of maintain your speed and try to keep yourself from stalling, but also get yourself behind the enemy. Uh, that's that's another way that you are engaged. And so across the process of engage of the system when you are dogfighting is we don't engage we don't engage with like the 3D space quite as much. Mm-hmm. We just use these maneuvers as a proxy for okay, if you're doing a high yo-yo, you are entering, you know, you're doing that to basically loop around behind whoever was trying to catch up to you. Because that's the instance in which you do a high yo-yo. You know, the instances in which you greatly increase or greatly reduce your altitude are the instances in which you are attempting to do something to your enemy. And if we create a maneuver for that, that acts as a proxy for that action, then we don't have to worry about the actual, your actual altitude at that time. Now, something we may end up doing just as a, you know, because some people are overly concerned, I, what I think are overly concerned with the grid, which is which is fine because that's just how they play. Something that we'll probably do is we will add small notes or an optional rule to the jam. It's like, okay, if somebody is using this maneuver, uh, this is what happens to their altitude. Assuming that, assuming that whatever airship they launch from is zero, uh, this is what happens to altitude or, or the sort of general plane everybody else is operating on. Because usually everybody is sort of level in the dogfight. Because you don't want to be too high. You don't want to be too low in relation to your enemy until certain things come to light. And that's why we use the maneuver system. 
So, so the TLDR is we don't have to worry about the 3D space as much if we use movements in that, if we use maneuvers to illustrate whatever it is that you would be trying to do by increasing or decreasing your altitude. Um, now, in the, now going, going further in, going further into that, um, sometimes, now, sometimes I've seen games have, um, have their own, have their own class specifically for say ace pilot or something like that. Um, is this something that you've, that you've planned when it comes to, when it comes to the character side of, um, airship, airship use? Or is it a, or is it a case where you don't want to have you don't want to have um, it pigeonholed that way? Uh, so I actually I actually don't mind in particular with Pathfinder 2. I feel like we have an excuse to let it be pigeonholed if we really want to. We could have it pigeon, pigeonholed a little bit, and that's not going to completely screw over the character because Pathfinder 2 gave some actual thought into what happens if somebody starts playing a class that they don't like, or if they need some modifications to it, what have, how can we help them? And they actually did that work in advance, which is, I love good on them. Um, ima imagine, imagine not having to worry about whether or not you were going to enjoy whatever it is that you picked a character creation from level three to 20 over the next year. And you could just say, "Hey, let me make a character, and if I don't like it, I can I can mix things up so that I do like it." Well, what a wonderful design space to work in. Um, so we have we have discussed things like additional feats that anybody that people will be able to take. Uh, we have discussed, and we've gone through and we've designed a few of those. Uh, it's still in note form, though, because I wanna, I, I wanna do. There's some number checking that Knight is going to teach me, and that's that's those feats are going to be our first kind of crack at that test. But when it comes to a dedicated character class, something we actually talked about initially was making this potentially an enclosed system using using Pathfinder two. But a self-enclosed system where there are not just a pilot class, there are different kinds of pilots. Uh, that was intended to be a stretch goal. Uh, we're not, unfortunately, the one sucky thing about designing for Pathfinder 2 is that there's not a huge Kickstarter base for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Uh, and so stretch goals... <laughs> oh, for that, for that matter... Yeah, we're not really looking at stretch goals. Well. There's, um, there, there, is a, there is a scene... When it comes when it comes to doing third when it comes to doing third party for Pathfinder two, but right now it's really tiny, especially since um, Pathfinder two is only has only been out for what a year. Yeah, it was something like yeah, it was August twenty nineteen, I think. Mm -hmm. So a year a year and change that, and um, there ha and there hasn't been a whole lot of um, form formatting advice. Especially, especially since Paizo is more is more cons is more concerned with putting out more adventure paths, right? Less less in the way of style guides and stuff like that. I I will say because I don't want to be over overtly cynical and stuff like that. I will say that the Pathfinder second those people who are in the crowdfunding space mm -hmm. are really generous. Yeah, this is one of like I did my research beforehand. Um. There are lots of Kickstarters out there who only have like 86 backers, but pulling in a few grand. Um, and, and, you know, I have 34 backers and right now we have, we're at $651 in terms of funding. And that is tremendously generous. Like insofar as the number of people who, I think the most common item that we sell is the, uh, is the hardcover where people are like, yeah, like we're going all in for this. And which is just, you know, I'm blown away by the generosity of people like that. It just, you know, there may not be enough of them. That's now, okay. Cause like, like I said, whether this gets crowdfunded or not, this will at some point come out. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes, now, when it comes to, um, when it, I want to talk a bit about mass combat, um, mm -hmm. since that's since that's going to be one of the other main pillars. Now, with 
ma now with um mass combat, a lot of a lot of times I've seen it end um it ends up playing out kind of kind of the way mass combat plays in a war game, which given given D and D and subsequently Pathfinder's um origin stories, um is not too surprising. But mm -hmm. what's the approach that you're doing with mass combat? Because obviously with D20-based things, there's already a precedent for mass combat systems. So I'm curious on your on your take. Uh, we just swapped out some of the names on Chainmail and we called it a day. <laughs> <laughs> is this is this your version of that of that whole the the um the best way to get the best way to get the most complicated job fin finished is to give it to the laziest guy in the room. Yes, I mean that's my that's my career in a in a sentence. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so with regards to mass combat, it was basically looking at small. I can't. So I actually can't speak as much to the numbers side because I I mostly kind of foisted this all night and I said like okay. When we're looking at these things, like I know that Pathfinder, for instance, Pathfinder Second Edition has much larger bonuses than 5e does because they have different ranges of of success and stuff like that. People think, um, I will not get into bounded accuracy at this moment and why why people are wrong in what they think it means rather than what it does mean. Um, but Pathfinder Second Edition doesn't precisely have bounded accuracy. Which is totally fine. It just means that some of the different numbers, some of the different bonuses are wildly different. Uh, or wildly, they vary wildly. And so I've mostly given control over the numbers to Knight. And I've just hit up certain like design premises and design goals. Hey, this needs to, this thing needs to work roughly 60% of, of the time against a target of X. So whatever you need to do in order to make sure that those numbers work like you have you have full reign over it in regards to those design principles it's mostly things like tracking very small numerical values as unit integrity deciding what happens when you win a battle deciding what happens when you loot a battle insofar as how long do casualties stay around do casualties mean dead people definitively and if so when and under what circumstances and then mostly just I, honestly the biggest part of it is just tracking the artillery that you have on your ship that is the single largest element of of our mass combat system is tracking the artillery that you have on your ship and how often it can fire given that you probably have some fighters in the line of fire mm -hmm. um now to now to that particular end, um, this is this is where we have to this is where we have to get to the elephant in the room who's decided to take a crash on my couch. And rip. <laughs> oh, Speak oh. about your wife that way. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? I'm too married to my work to get to get hitched. Um, Let's talk. Let's talk about how magic is gonna is gonna be play, is gonna play in factor when it comes to mass combat. Because sometimes, no, sometimes you don't. Oh, you don't need. You don't need it. Hmm. Like some, no, I said please do. Some like some sometimes I've seen games where they have a completely separate set of spells solely for mass combat. Sometimes there will be additional um, mass combat um, tags. Or the rules when casting in that form on somebody's spell list, or so, or something like that, because inevitably you're going to ha you're going to have um, mage artillery or so or something like that on ships. It's just going to happen. You're going. Absolutely, to, I, I can attest to that. You're you're going or you're going to have some sort of fighter pilot who, um, instead instead of instead of mounting machine guns on on his biplane. Um, just throw, just throws just um gets as close to a capital ship as he can and throws fireball. Yeah, and in fact, we have a we have a dedicated system for of traps and stuff like that that you can attach to fighters, and we're working on magic item incorporation, particularly the we're starting with the easiest one, which is runes. It's like, hey, there are these magic items that just give you simple small bonuses. What if we put them on fire? I said yes. 
I was I wasn't expecting tonight to bring that up though. There was these super simple uh bonuses that could be placed on specific magic items, but uh once he brought it up to me, I was like, Yeah, we'll we'll absolutely convert this. But when it comes to spell I, I understand the so when it's armies fighting, when it's armies fighting, I understand the avoidance of certain designers saying, Hey, like, hey, we are not going to spend time on what happens if you cast a fireball on this army because it's an army and it's a fireball and we're actually not all that worried about how much damage it does that's a bit of a wasted that's that's potentially burnt page space on something that could be way cooler than that so we're just going to focus on large spells I, to I totally get it when designers do that and it's justified because a lot of times units are going to be, I mean, take Matt Colville's example, like a lot of time units are going to be very spry, the they're, they're not packed into the maximally optimal space for them to all get wiped out by a fireball. This is a world in which fireballs exist. They're going to be avoiding that. And even if fireballs didn't exist in this world, they would never do that in the first place, uh, except under very specific circumstances in very specific time periods. So, so I get it. I get why they just go immediately to the idea of, of spells designed for mass combat. But, but when it comes to an airship system, uh, all these, like, presumably, you're in the air. And all the units that you have on board are actually kind of artificially constrained insofar as... One moment. Artificially constrained insofar as as where they can move where they where they can hide this airship is 50 feet long a fireball actually can catch a lot of people right that is plausible so um, when it comes to minor so but it's not the most devastating thing in the world still because people you know people are going to have preparations they're going to be able to take cover behind crates and stuff like that but also sometimes those crates might be filled with gunpowder and, and maybe it won't work out so well, or maybe they dive below the lower decks. There's all these different options. So fireball, like just taking the example of a fireball, that would be equivalent roughly to a smaller piece of artillery, depending on the target. Mm -hmm. And there are certain conditions under which it would be equivalent to a larger piece of artillery, like a cannon or a siege howitzer or whatever, or maybe a bit of magical artillery. And so that's the that's the design space that we have for spells, is that they function mostly as artillery, depending on, and you know the numbers that we use to calculate that are dependent on a few things like how much damage dice does it do, uh, what kind of what kind of does it have an area of effect, and if so, what kind? And that adjusts that just damage values up and down. And if you have something that is going to give you additional dice or additional damage for this, it's going to be pretty easy to convert. I think under that system to, con to convert it appropriately and say, okay, this is where a fireball counts as instead of three, counts as five as an artillery piece when we're lining up the different numbers. Yeah. When, and in the, in that, in that particular regard, obvious now, given the, given the fact that you and I are, vi are, um, are in our individuals who have a love hate relationship with, um, for, with the first party end of the 20 games, um, I'm guessing that you've had some you've had some degree of effort to make sure that mages aren't auto win even in mass combat. Oh yeah, well that, that's why I, went, I well first off love and hate in regards to D twenty as in I love one of those companies and hate the other. Uh, <laughs> second, <laughs> second yeah that that's what that basically everything I was talking about with regards to the fireball and how fireball is basically counted as low level artillery. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's where that works out. Now, if you have somebody with a really high level spell, like if you have whatever Pathfinder 2's equivalent of Meteor Swarm is, I, I haven't even Meteor it. Swarm. Yeah, so Pathfinder 2's equivalent of Meteor Swarm, um, which is five E's Meteor Swarm, which is three point five, etc. The uh, <laughs> so Pathfinder 2's Meteor Swarm, uh, that's going to be pretty devastating, 
And there are certain instances in which we're going to count spells as, depending on their different traits, as maybe being even more powerful than they would be in an individual combat situation. Just thanks to the sheer amount of panic and destruction they're going to cause. You know, player characters often don't have to do things like make uh, wisdom or will saving throws or, or you know, have a high enough will defense or whatever when facing something that is just powerful that doesn't cause a supernatural effect of fear. But when you have a, when you have a bunch of crew on your ship and they just watched a bunch of stuff detonate, you know, like literal meteors just smacked into their ship, like, okay, that's going to freak them out. And that's going to be more effective than had it just been used on the PCs. So there are instances and they're going to, they're not going to be common where certain spells are, are more effective than they otherwise would be. Mm -hmm. um, but also that that's a design, having that as a design kind of uh, constraint also allows me to say, okay, well, maybe there are some spells that are just kind of crap over. I don't know if Pathfinder 2nd Edition has an equivalent to Wall of Sand, um, but I can think of a Wall of Sand actually being pretty good if you'd like pop it on a... on a line of artillery like man that would really suck for whoever was doing those options so maybe that would so that maybe that would actually add a little bit or maybe that would you know something like that would decrease points on the enemy mass combat vessel you know so so yeah there we are taking that into consideration i do not think that mages should be able to auto win against armies i think that's dumb but I do like the idea that under certain circumstances, like the ones we mentioned where movement is kind of artificially constrained by the fact that you can't jump off this airship because you'll die, uh, in which they are more effective. Yeah. Now, when it com when it comes to um, fighters, and this this was something that just popped in my head in the last in the last minute, um, how? When it comes to the size of something that you would consider a fighter, how small can it get? And if you're thinking that, that this is me asking, can, can I have the equivalent of the Rocketeer during, during airship, airship combat? The answer to that question is yes. Now looking at the Rocketeer. So are you talking about, like, I, I don't think they're jetpack-sized. Yeah, I'm. So, I'm saying. I'm saying that you're, we're probably not going to have a um, fighter who's the, who's basically just a guy with a jetpack holding a, holding a um, crossbow. No, no, that's not like. Well, he would have a gun, but because mm -hmm. we are adding guns, <laughs> but um, but no, it see it see it seems unlikely to me that that we would go that small. We will be going fairly small. Like so, we have a few design. Here's the thing: we have a few design goals in regards to the size of the fighter. Where like these need to be able to be launched from airships, and the smallest airships, because they need to be carry, be able to carry them around, and uh, and they need to be able to basically defend themselves with all the considerations we mentioned earlier in regards to mass combat and how dog fighters can. Fighters can actually impede mass combat, the effectiveness of certain vehicles there, and how that's an important thing for for that's the value of an ace pilot mm -hmm. is that they impede the ability of a much larger force to just wipe your ship off the map. So they need to be able to get pretty small. Uh probably about like like we're looking at 10 feet is probably the smallest one. And then anything below that is probably going to be magic items and, you know, magic carpets, magic uh, capes, magic chat pack. Yeah, and um, look, when it um, I will I will note that when it comes to the idea of somebody using a magic jet pack in this, um, they are banned from making any um, Iron Man jokes. Oh God, yeah. I mean, I, I just assume that Marvel is banned in general. Um, I, I don't want that at my at my table. Fine to enjoy, fine to enjoy. Just maybe not at my table. 
Um, I mean, if some if somebody it when for me at least it's a case of if somebody really really wants to use their own version of the Iron Man suit at, at my table, I I um my approach is okay, fine, but you've got to you've got to rip, but I want but I want you to convince me. <laughs> like yeah, if you tell me you, on this thing that is kind of absurd. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm no stranger to absurdity, but at the same at the same level, I'm not going to I'm not going to just throw some Monty Hall bullshit in in my campaigns just be, just because somebody mm -hmm. can't think outside of Disney. Yeah. Well, that's a different like our absurd is is Jack Vance where there are air cars along swashbuckling adventurers mm -hmm. and like we have dune is not absurd but dune is is certainly do do well like we we think back to the 1900s we mm -hmm. think back to the the various novels of the 1900s and the yeah the pole exciting bear. swashbuckling stories that were told mm -hmm. right we're not thinking of how do we how do we stat the hulk out in 5e Ugh. One somebody's are one somebody's already done done it and it's and it was meh. Um, two, if I'm gonna stat the Hulk out in some in a D twenty based game, I'm using mutants and masterminds because, to my reckoning, nobody nobody's done a um a superhero hack of fifth edition's rule set. Um, the way that the way that mutants and masterminds started out as a um a hack of third edition's rule set into superheroes because the fact of the matter is if you're doing supers with the d20 system you're gonna have to blow some things up um, right i mean look at look at 5e this is basically a no it's a very grecian it's a very greek hero sort of game if you think about it mm -hmm. with regards to how survivable pcs are it's like it's actually maybe maybe kratos isn't that far off from base 5e if you think about certain things yeah the the only problem that i Perfect. have the only problem that i have with that is um is the fact that kratos is a kratos is a fighter and we know d and we know D, &D has the biggest hate boner for anybody who's not casting spells hey 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 5e has the biggest hate boner for anybody casting spells out of any edition of the game no, no, it has the biggest boner for people casting spells because of the goddamn giant spell list. Hey, the spell list means nothing if I can't cast most of the stuff that's on it. That doesn't count. It does. If it they does. punish me for casting spells, that that just means that they're punishing me more often than not. <laughs> Look, all all I'm saying is that the is that the is that the bigger the spell list is, the less attention that can be given to other parts. I I I I personally disagree, mostly just because I've given the, I think I've I've probably given the most in Lords of Brackets. I've probably given the most attention to martial classes that any game has, and the that that has magic alongside of it, without just nuking, uh, without just nuking the options of casters to begin with. Well, Lord Lords of Brackets is a is a whole other can of worms, that, anyways. But right. I'm mostly referring to the um van the vanilla stuff because I did check this and um. Third edition of and and first edition Pathfinder were two of the worst offenders when it came to the ratio of book size total versus how many pages of just spells. Right. Um, and when well, I think we've had this conversation before about the uh, about like how we how we treat spells and stuff like that. Like oh I, we have oh we have because it's gonna because it's been a sore spot for years and I think it's. As long as long as as long as people are gonna are gonna act like grognards ab about the idea that a fighter does something more than just one goddamn thing, I think I think we're probably gonna keep talking, t keep griping about this until we're dead. Yeah, no, no I like it, but I sympathize as as much as you do. I'm as angry as you are with the exclusion of maneuvers from. Uh, from all martial classes in 5e and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I don't think that they need the same number of... I don't think they need anywhere close to the number of options that spellcasters should have, just because I think that martial classes should... I think there's an expectation that if you choose a martial class, you're choosing something maybe 
not necessarily simpler, but something that has a has a smaller number of options to combine. But I completely, but yeah, I, I agree that they are yeah. they are underserved. Um, I just don't blame spellcasters for that, and I very much refuse to uh, say that a game with a concentration system like Five E's uh, treats treats spellcasters kindly. Yeah, I for, <laughs> I I keep I keep forgetting about the whole concentration thing because um, that was fucking stupid. Yes, um, yes, but indeed. I'm get, but I'm getting off track now. We never do that here. <laughs> when it comes now, when it comes to the um, when it comes to the page, when it comes to the page count for um, trails through the skies, what are you shooting at? Three hundred to four hundred. Now is is that a yep. is that a serious page size? Or are you just fucking with me? No, no, that no, that's a serious page size. the The issue that we have is that. Uh, looking at stretch goals could inflate it seriously mm -hmm. and might actually incentivize us to cut certain not superfluous like 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 okay having having additional sections for maybe gunslinger archetypes and, and a gunslinger class and things of that sort because we were adding new kinds of equipment here because obviously we're working with we are working with the Brackus assumption of a of a sort a sort of early twentieth century fantasy world that that group you know an early twentieth century world that grew up alongside magic and and was significantly altered by it uh, and taking that assumption into account like okay uh, feats for feats for maybe you know having a gun crafting system which which Knight has actually just developed that might if we have a starter adventure included, which I don't think that I, I don't think that don't quote me on, I guess I shouldn't say it. we are not sure that if, if the Kickstarter doesn't go through, we're not sure if we're going to have a starting adventure that might just be in a separate book, which would probably also just be free. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you're getting a print version of it. But like for like, if we, if we include the starter adventure, because the, Kickstarter picks up and the kick the crowdfunding actually goes through, then certain things like gun crafting might be cut. So that's where the that's where the variable page count goes. But no, like we have looking at the different sections of the book, like we have all right, we have dog fighting, we have mass combat, we have the basic airships and explanation of their function. We have many explanations of their function. Mm -hmm. This is many different kinds of airships. We have traps that are specifically designed for the air. We have artillery, a large selection of artillery. We have templates that are the, the form of customization that you can't stack on top of one another. But then we have patterns, which are the form of customization like you just keep stacking them on top of one another as long as you want, provided that you have enough money for it. And then we have the fighters themselves. And then we have a ever-growing bestiary, which is probably the one of... In terms of a single section and page count, mm -hmm. the beast area will be the biggest. Yeah. Now, and, and that's when I came up just briefly. That's when I came up with the estimate for the page count because I was looking at what I did with, like, we have this is a working title. We have not come up with their actual name yet. Uh, but Puffer Glues uh, is their working title, which is small, like a swarm. A small little fish that kind of like puff up and then they glue them si themselves to the side of an airship to start digesting it. Uh, and they puff rapidly to kind of increase their mass. And then they increase their weight on account of the, the type of glue that they produce when they make contact with something. Uh, and that starts bringing down, you know, that brings down airships or that brings down uh, large, you know, lar large flying creatures. And there's a there's a plant that has learned to live in a kind of symbiotic relationship with it mm -hmm. that we've that we also sat at and like okay at the end of all this looking at how much space the stat block is going to take up that's going to be two to three pages alone at least unless I come up with a new concept or or like a enemy variant that I'm also going to step out and that's that's another page. And that's all for like one relatively minor monster that does not have a lot of 
uh, compared to some of the other things that we're creating, does not have a lot of like lore behind it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's mostly explanations of its ecology and some of the things that you can that you can harvest from it and how you might come across it. Yeah. Now. That's how is, we came to the page count. Would is one would um one of the things you'd be con you'd be considering. I know I, I know I harped on the whole vehicles as their own as their own sheet, but is a vehicle sheet something that you've considered for this? Uh yes, just because one I have a little bit more experience in things like InDesign now, or at the very least Photoshop. So if I can't really, even if I end up not being able to parse uh InDesign as much as I want. Uh, one Knight has also used InDesign. They also have a. Uh, he also has an additional uh, program under his belt that I cannot remember the name of at the moment, but it's another markup program. Mm -hmm. So he has that kind of experience, uh, and then we could just you know combine our heads, and uh, in that process, a character sheet will magically pop out. But no, when it comes to filling out the a sheet on which you can basically talk about your ship uh we have that we have inventory we're hoping based on the fact that i have this is another advantage of having a co-writer is given that i have somebody to take care of like mechanical going into the numbers and stuff like that i have so much more time on my hands is i'm able to do things like make art <laughs> I can, I can do things like, for instance, make uh, ship plans and deck plans. Mm -hmm. And I can tell people like, hey, because we have we have an inventory system that we were that we were floating. That was basically based on um, based on how many squares an individual thing was filling up. Where we weren't going to worry all that much about weight, because chances are you were never going to approach your actual weight limit. So we were like, okay, well, what if we do inventory by like, all right, if you buy a bunch of cannonballs, you don't, you're not calculating the space that three cannonballs take up. You're calculating the space of whatever crate they're stored in and all of the, all of the things within the crate to make sure that they're not in a, in an inconvenient position should the crate get destroyed or rocked about by turbulence or whatever or by battle so so we we have considerations for sheets that you can fill out and you know hopefully hopefully that includes the actual deck plan of the ship like you would just be able to you'd have that you know stapled to your character sheet it's like well let me flip over here this is what our ships looks like yeah now when uh, and of course we're probably we're probably gonna have an index of some of some kind. Thank God, um, <laughs> because if yeah, there's a good chance I'm just hiring an editor for that. And because we're gonna have an index, you might as well just have it done professionally. It's the most expensive part of hiring an editor to do something on your on a book like this, especially like an RPG product. They really hate doing indexes, um, but I I think it's worth it. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it come now, <sighs> brain start work start working, please. Um. Now, when it comes when it comes to a when it comes to a release window, give, given how long it took for Astral Tides to come around, which was it, which was part of that whole break Kickstarter experiment, um. I'm guessing that um, no, no matter what, it's gonna it's gonna take a while to put to put out trails through the skies. Um, not quite as much. This is the, I guess we're going back to the co-writer thing. Mm -hmm. Um, the last ten percent of Astral Tides took roughly as long as the other ninety percent in regards to finishing it up. Because it was all the minutia and small details and small numbers and going over and editing things that maybe, you know, making sure that, you know, did the document actually save here? Did it cut off this paragraph? Because that was a problem. And that was one of the problem, one of the many problems with Airships of Brachus. 
Uh, and well, I guess I do. I have, I, I really need to put this lore out, but I do, do I have enough time to put this lore out? And then I had an instance where, like I mentioned earlier, where some of the cities and stuff like that didn't make it, didn't make it into the book, whole bunch of, you know, in, in regards to the book itself, wasted work because they didn't make it in because I wasn't able to do, you know, here are the major cities to practice. I have those, uh, but I don't have them for Nizanaban. I don't have them for Nures, and so I kind of can't include them because then people are going to be wondering, like, well, why are those cities for Brackus, but not Zanaban or Nores or Vilagos or whatever? So that's. But when you have a co writer, you have an additional resource insofar as, like, in addition to just like you have two people writing at the same time, is I get to all of the fluff stuff, as I mentioned, like, it did not take me long at all to, to start writing up the lore description for the for the puffer glues and and writing out quite a lengthy lore description like it's not finished yet but it, it's already because it's already lengthy and already taking up a page or two and i'm considering whether or not to just add another page on because it's easy um it just completely like like the the space for me to just go ham on lore and just keep filling up the page count really at at my heart's content because i have somebody else taking over the particulars of the mechanics means that i can like we're, we, i i feel like we're doing twice the work in half the time if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah so i'm not expecting and also i'm not expecting covid 20 to come out <laughs> Uh, which was the other big and say that was a that was one of the other big things because my fan my finances took part part of the biggest hit from my fine eh, the second biggest hit of my finances was was all the money I had to spend basically prepping for potential potential lock what was then potential lockdown and me not being able to work and just just having food stored up and stuff like that and then. In addition to that, the fact that I was not able to work at my day job for a little while also caused another financial hit because my day job takes care of uh, one, it just takes care of my other bills, and two, a lot, a lot of the leftover from my day job goes towards floating Azure creativity whenever we're having like wh whatever you would consider to be a hard month for a business like mine, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but given that those circumstances don't uh, don't look to be repeating themselves, uh, I'm certainly I'm still certainly more cautious now that I've gone through it. But I have a co-writer. Uh, I'm doing the part of the page count, and I'm doing the part of the the part the portion of the book that I think I'm most skilled at at this point, and that I'm leaving the particulars of mechanics that I would normally spend. A huge amount of part on uh, amount of time on that last ten percent of the book that takes as long as to write as the previous ninety percent. That's in somebody else's hands. So so no, this is going to be a, a if it go if it goes through on Kickstarter, this will be a much shorter project. If it doesn't go through on Kickstarter, we're going to be doing some other things in crowdfunding while we do this one, and basically change our change our business approach to how we push out trails for the skies all right i can de i can definitely um i can definitely go with that would you would you say that if you were to ballpark it would you say that it would be done by um um winter or by you... winter oh no no no, no. It, it would be this is 20 like our hardcover copy estimate is may 2021 mm -hmm. but um what a as far as in February, I guess it's technically winter. Is February twenty twenty one is when we have a, the uh, digital copy. I had to make sure it wasn't March. Well, I w I would say February is technically winter around me, but um, given that I live in Minnesota, anything anything that doesn't that um has even a hint of snow is con is considered winter. I.e., half the goddamn year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm not exactly the best met the best metric to base that on. Um, but even but even with that, I'll definitely be keeping an eye out on on how it develops. Um, one one way or the one way or the other, obviously. And 
to the to that end, I do once again, I do want to um thank you for ta for taking the time to come on because it's always fu it's always fun having you on even if we get dangerously close to going into shit post territory. Oh, who am I kidding? <laughs> We're both a couple of shit posters anyways. <laughs> yeah. That's never going away. Yeah. Um at the at the at the um, ver, at the very least, um, I think something like Trails to the Skies could be could be could be used to to um to give us the clo to give us the closest thing to a tabletop skies of Arcadia that we're ever gonna get. <laughs> at least until Lords of Brackets comes out. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm hoping I don't make end up making that a running gag like like I did when I was waiting on John Romero to finish Sigil. I mean, well, yeah, with regards to that. <laughs> with regards to what skies of Arcadia or um... no, reg in regard to in regards to, to Lords of Brackus. Ah, uh, I, I got you. I don't want to make a running gag throughout my videos. Going, I wonder when Lords of Brackus is coming out. Um, no, play, play test should be done soon. I'm I'm also happy to report because I've always got you know I've always got many irons in the fire, and oh, yeah. in the Discord I've been posting. Different like weapon traits and different spell traits and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I'm like, okay, this is this is a much more coherent vision than it was a year ago. I'm guessing a year ago it was something it was something that it would look like a doctor's handwriting. Uh, it probably still does, uh, just in a different font. Mm -hmm. I need to adapt my hand, my terrible handwriting to uh, to a WordPress font or a, uh, <laughs> a Word document font. I mean, not, I, I'm not one. I'm not one to talk. I'm not one to talk, given my own handwriting. But still, um, but if, of course, I mean, this goes without saying. But anytime you, anytime you see fit to to return, even if it, even if it's just to laugh at laugh at other people's mistakes, um, the door is the door is always open. Um, Absolutely, I've been I've been previously occupied on Sunday nights, but it doesn't look like that's going to be the that doesn't really look to be the case anymore, so I should be able to hop in more often, oh, which I'm happy about. Yep. And if well, you you already know where you already know where to find 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 me on that front. Um, and of course, and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present. My name is Mildra. I am your gimming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.